Hello and welcome. My name is Jim Frankel, and I am the founder and director of Music First. It's my pleasure to be here with you today, albeit virtually, at your conference. Thanks for coming to my session. This session is titled Tech Tools for Sight Reading and Accurate Performance Assessment. I hope uh, that the, the tools that I share, the ideas that I share, uh, will help you uh, regardless of whether or not you're a Music First customer or plan on becoming one. Um, so let's just dive right in, shall we? Why is sight reading important? We all know that uh, from a musical perspective, the reason that sight reading is important is that it certainly will help your ensemble's learning uh, repertoire, whether it's a band, a choir, an orchestra, any a modern band, whatever the ensemble, the better the readers uh, that the students are, the quicker they'll be able to at least get the musical you know, notes, what's on the page under their belts so that you can spend your time focusing on what's important, which is you know, shape, blend, phrasing, balance, all the things that make ensembles um, you know, truly special. Um, I know that when I taught middle school band, sight reading was the thing I spent the least time on. And the reason for that, and I'm, I'm, I'm not ashamed to admit it, is I didn't have enough rehearsal time as it, as it was. Uh, there was, you know, 42 minute rehearsal time is what I had three times a week, if that. And um, by the time the students got in their places, got their instruments out, and we were able to play that first scale of the first warm up, we, we'd already lost six or seven minutes. And I had to give them at least three, four minutes at the end of the period so that they could pack up their instruments and be ready to leave when the bell rang. So because of that truncated amount of time, maybe 30, 35 minutes of actual rehearsal time, I just didn't have the time to walk over to my music library, pull out a score, distribute the parts, ask them to play. And obviously when, when kids are sight reading and they don't do it a lot, it doesn't always sound great. Um, so you'd hear like a kind of a, a decent basic performance and you wouldn't get through, uh, you know, the whole piece for sure. And then they'd hand it back in. And then by the time that was done, I had probably quote unquote wasted another 10 minutes of rehearsal time. And I know that wasted is probably too strong of a word. But when I was a middle school band director, <laughs> all I was caring about was were the kids ready to play their concert and until they were, I wasn't interested in anything else. It was a singular mission to make sure that their music that I had selected for them was as good as possible. We also all know that if a student is going to audition for any type of honor ensemble, whether it's an all county band, an all region band, an all state band, whatever the honor ensemble is, even in a district, the, the differentiator almost always between the student who gets into the ensemble and the student who just misses or, or doesn't have a great audition is almost always based on their sight reading. Um, for example, uh, I live in New York, uh, the NISMA Evaluation Festival, there are three sections, the scales, the sight reading, and the solo. Uh, when I taught in, in New Jersey, same thing, the kids had to have their scales put ready, they were given a sight reading selection and then they had the repertoire that they'd been working on. So um, what typically happened, at least when I was preparing my students, is that when it came to sight reading, I, I did it maybe once or twice before they went to the audition. So they weren't properly prepared uh, to be sight readers. Uh, you know, I'd give them advice, but the kids who would nail their sight reading example had a much better chance of getting into the ensemble. And I think, that, again, no matter what ensemble you teach, you all know that, that the, the sight reading is probably the most important part of the audition uh, because you would assume that the students already have their scales and have been working on that solo for so long that the only kind of intangible or thing that's up for any kind of risk or unknown is the sight reading. I know I've spent quite a bit of time on it, but to me, sight reading is extremely important and unfortunately, at least for me, I'm not speaking for everybody, it was the thing that I cut out of my rehearsal time uh, because I was just trying to get the repertoire under their belts. So it is extremely important. So moving on, why is accurate performance assessment important? Now I'm gonna say something 
somewhat heretical. Uh, you know, I run Music First, and as part of that, I help design and implement our performance assessment software called Practice First. And we're all familiar with this kind of red note, green note assessment that Smart Music brought to the market over two decades ago. Um, and, and that is part of the kind of regular way that we're preparing our students, getting them to practice, getting them ready to play their repertoire or their scales or whatever it is. Um, and the heretical part is that I really don't like that idea of a computer assessing a student's musicality. If you think about it, a computer really can only judge based on zeros and ones. That's it. It's a binary code. Kids are playing or singing into their computer and an algorithm that a computer, it's really just a mathematical formula, will listen to that student's performance, whether it's singing or playing an instrument, and give them a grade, right? If you think about that for just longer than 10 seconds, it gets really, really weird that a computer in an inanimate object is telling a child how musical they are or how accurately they played something. Well, I would argue very strongly that that is not really the purpose of performance assessment software. The purpose to me is I just want the kids to be engaged. I want them to be practicing. I want them to be playing their instrument in, in perhaps a, a game-like way so that they're trying to get a better score, trying to improve, but that should not be the be-all, end-all of the assessment process. You, as the choir director, band director, orchestra director, ensemble director, you are ultimately in charge of giving accurate performance assessment of your students. But when we have large ensembles, you know, hundreds of students, we can't do it. There is not enough time in the day. So performance assessment software can be a really helpful tool, an aid for a teacher. So with that kind of said, the philosophical underpinnings of where I'm coming from, then you better make sure that that assessment software is as accurate as possible. So if something is 80% accurate, is that good enough? Think about any other aspect of your life. Um, think about, uh, you know, um, the, uh, uh, any kind of test, a medical test, a COVID test, if you will. If it's only 80% accurate, are you going to trust it? Um, so a lot of the assessment algorithms that are out there um, are, you know, kind of a question mark as to how accurate they are. So um, at uh, Music First, we um, partnered with an amazing company from Estonia called Match My Sound. Now they're US based. And they had, in my opinion, when I saw it, the most accurate assessment algorithm I had ever seen. And the reason, the rationale for that is that their, um, their assessment algorithm is actually based on audio rather than MIDI. Now I'm, I know I'm getting nerdy really, really fast, but like, go with me on this. Um, the, the students that play or sing into practice first are actually having their voice or their instrument recorded. And that recording makes an audio wave, a waveform. You've probably have seen them. If you've used something like Audacity or GarageBand, you see the little waveforms of your audio. <coughs> well, practice first compares the student's audio to a <coughs> baseline audio recording. So it actually layers the, um, uh, the student's recording over the, the baseline recording and measures the difference in those two uh, audio waves. And in, in our opinion, and we're pretty much right on this, that is the most accurate way, rather than taking an audio wave and comparing it to MIDI information. So we think that the practice first algorithm, which is called match my sound, is by far the most accurate. And that's why I'm so excited to put my name behind it, the name of the company behind it. We called it Practice First for that, for that very reason. So accurate performance assessment, if you're going to use software, is pretty critical. So how can you know, site reading and, and um, performance assessment software help you, especially during uh, the COVID-19 era? I mean, for, for many of us in the United States, uh, I'm recording this in late November of 2020, we're right now going through a very dark period. There are a lot of schools closed. A lot of ensembles are not meeting in person. Uh, they might only be meeting in, uh, virtually. And, and that's just, it's not musical. We all know that. Um, but we're doing the best we can. And I think that the most important thing we can do as music teachers, 
is keep our students engaged. Because this is all going to end, and when it does end, we want those children, those students, in those seats. So in this period, this kind of waiting period between last March and whenever the heck this ends, we want those students engaged. And in my opinion, software like Sight Reading Factory, which I'm going to be showing you a little later, as well as Practice First and the new kid on the block, Note Flight with Soundcheck, these are great ways of keeping students engaged during, uh, you know, they're playing, they're singing, they're, they're, they're actively learning, they're, they're seeing what they've done wrong, and they're correcting it, they're self-correcting. Um, really, really important. And in my opinion, it's like a critical aspect of retention and, and keeping our programs going and alive so that when all of this is over, we can just kind of pick up where we left off, if you will, and get right back in there and start conducting and making great music again. But the bottom line though, and this is pre-COVID and now probably even more so afterwards, it's that the average student in middle school and high school aggregate is seven and a half hours per day on their devices. That's a lot of time. So I personally believe, especially if you look at this picture, most of these kids are on phones, that your kind of approach to technology with sight reading and um, performance assessment had better include phones because that's where students live. That's where they are and you need to meet them there. Um, if you give them really restrictive kind of, oh, well, you can only do this on a Chromebook from this date after, or you can only do this on a laptop using this software um, with this operating system, it's going to limit and kind of um, put uh, a barricade or obstacle in front of the students being able to successfully engage uh, with these software titles. So one of the things we're so proud of at Music First is that we are, all of our pro, all of our platforms um, will work, especially sight reading and and, um, and and performance assessment, will work on the student's phone. So there is no restriction. There is no, well, you have to use this on an iPad using the Safari browser. No, just pick up your phone, use the, use, uh, use the software and get assessed. So just quickly, what is Music First? Um, for, the, for some of you, you're already a customer, you already know what Music First is. For those of you that are not familiar, um, we are the only uh, comprehensive learning management system that was purposely built for K-12 music education. So there are, other, there are other learning management systems out there. Google Classroom, Canvas, and Schoology are probably the most three popular. And those are great platforms. However, they have nothing for you as a music teacher. They come blank. It's an empty bucket that you have to fill with all stuff that you create. So um, we are totally different than those. We work the same way in that you can post an assignment, students can log in, complete the assignment, you can add it to a grade book, all of those things that you expect. But how we are different, and this is really important, is that we have a gigantic library of content that has already been created for you. Hundreds and hundreds of pre-made quizzes and tests, lesson plans, units, there are even year-long courses that you can use is kind of an example of a best practice, what other people are using our platform for. You can start the year off with a pre-made course and use or not use the content that's included in them. And on top of the content, the other thing that we think is super exciting is that we have 10 different software titles that you can add to the classroom that will customize it for you. There are certain things, like if you're a choir director, there's certain software that fits your needs. If you're a band director, there's certain software that fits your needs. If you're not a performance ensemble director, you're a middle school general music teacher, there's stuff there for you. You are going to customize the software lineup for the way you teach, the goals of your program, and what you want your students to do. Now, there are other platforms out there that will claim to be the only or the comprehensive plat. you know, all of that is, is great for them to put in a marketing slogan, but I'm telling you as the founder and director of the company, we have 10 different software titles. We are by far the most comprehensive and our content library is just unequaled. So um, just real quick from a compatibility standpoint, because that always comes up, we work on absolutely every platform, every device. Um, only one of our software programs has a caveat, which I'll get to in a moment. But um, for performance ensembles, specifically sight reading and practice first, it does not matter what device the students have or what device you have. 
they will be able to get to it as long as they can access the Chrome browser. And just quickly, the reason that the Chrome browser is the main uh, browser of choice for music teachers or is because that's where all the music programmers are creating software. And specifically, there are two things about the Chrome browser that make it really wonderful. One is called Web Audio. The other is called Web MIDI. And those two little, you know, kind of secret sauce packets, if you will, are what make music production and music recording in the Chrome browser so great. Now, can you use other browsers? Uh, yes, um, but all of our software is optimized for Chrome. So if you use something like Safari, there are things that just simply won't work. If you use Firefox, almost everything works, but the Chrome browser is, the, is our strong recommendation um, for you. Now, uh, what I said earlier about some software, there's, uh, we do have the folks at Apple really don't like the folks uh, at Google, or at least that's the way I see it, because they will not allow anybody that's using the Chrome browser on an iOS device, specifically an iPhone or an iPad, to access the microphone through Google Chrome, right? So instead, Apple makes you uh, uh, create an app. By the way, they've unlocked the microphone access for Safari, so you might see other software that says, oh, if you're using an iPad, you have to use a Safari browser. Uh, it's just not a great browser. We're not gonna do that. We don't think it's, we, we're really not interested. So instead, we have a free Music for a Student app for iPhones and iPads and that app will allow you to use um, the software on your phones. Now, specifically the software that I'm gonna be mentioning today, uh, which is Sight Reading Factory, Practice First, and Note Flight with Soundcheck. Um, Sight Reading Factory does have their own iOS app, which lets you use the microphone, so you'll have to install that one as well. Practice First and Note Flight do not require a separate app, and believe it or not, this might make you go, huh? But Sight Reading Factory's app, you'll never actually open. Um, instead, you'll do everything in the Music for a Student app. And when you launch Sight Reading Factory from the Music for a Student app, it will launch that Sight Reading Factory app on your phone. It will log you in. If you try to use that app by itself, it's going to ask you for a username and password. And if you try putting in your Music First username and password, it doesn't work. So that might be a little confusing. Just know that what I'm gonna show you today, you'll, if your students are using iPhones and iPads, they will need the free Music for a Student app and they will need the free Sight Reading Factory app installed on their devices. So as I mentioned earlier, we have 10 software titles at Music First and no one else can, can say this. So uh, let's just real quick, um, some of these are, are, are um, applicable to an ensemble director and others really aren't. Focus on sound which is included with every copy of Music First Classroom, is an encyclopedia and it's got hundreds and hundreds of pre-made quizzes and tests and lesson plans. Very, very popular program. O Generator is for kids who just wanna make beats. So it's a beat making app. Um, it, it does, believe it or not, have some instrumental lessons included in it. It's got um, composition lessons included in it. Um, but O Generator is usually taken away if you buy Practice First. And the reason for that is that practice first, we recently added thousands and thousands of pieces of content from other publishers, and we use the money that you would have spent on O-Generator, and most ensemble directors uh, that we have found aren't using it at all. So we took the money from there, we put it to buy, I mean, thousands and thousands of pieces uh, for practice first, which makes everybody happy. So practice first is our performance assessment uh, software, a direct competitor to smart music. Um, sight Reading Factory, which I'm going to show you today, is hands down the most popular sight reading tool that's out there. Aurelia is an ear training program made by Rising Software. It's been around for 20 years. It's extraordinary. We have Aurelia First, um, which is perfect for ensembles, for ear training. And Musician is Music Theory. Again, perfect for ensembles. Really great uh, stuff. Then we have two notation programs, Flat for Education and Note Flight Learn. No Flight Learn over the summer of 2020 added a, a feature called Soundcheck, which allows you to assess anything that you've created in Note Flight. And believe it or not, although this might be a little confusing, certainly, uh, but, but you'll get it. Practice First and No Flight Learn both use that exact same assessment algorithm for Match My Sound. And I'll get later on, I'll talk about why you might want one over the other. 
then we have two versions of what I would call like a garage band or a digital audio workstation. Soundation, which is the only piece of software that does not work on iOS devices. And Soundtrap, which does work on everything. So a lot of people opt for Soundtrap because they know their students might be using an iPhone or an iPad at home. Soundation is perfect if you have like a one-to-one -one program with Chromebooks, it works beautifully. Uh, but Soundtrap just happens to be uh, uh, much more popular uh, with our customers because of the fact that it works on every device. So <clears throat> I'm only gonna be focusing on these three today, Sight Reading Factory, Practice First, and No Flight Learn with Soundcheck. Um, the others are all great, and I'll be sharing, if you would like a free 30-day trial, I'll share at the end how to go ahead and get that. Um, we have four different site types of software integrations, uh, which are important. Uh, the first uh, type is called a generic task. Uh, this is great. In practice first, let's say that you want your students to just go in and choose any piece that they want to submit for assessment. We have a generic assignment. It's one button click for you. Re it makes it really easy. So if you're choir, you say, hey, I'd like you to go in, find a Christmas carol that you would like to sing and submit for assessment and let the kids choose it. Um, that way you don't have to create multiple assignments. So generic tests are really popular. Uh, because it's a one-click uh, assignment for teachers. The specific task is, hey students, I would like you to go and perform this specific exercise or this specific piece of repertoire. So you're giving them a very, very, you know, clear, like when they click on it, it opens up the piece of repertoire that you'd like them to perform. There's a template task. Template tasks, the easiest way to describe it is, we have an audio recorder that's really great. If you wanted to upload a backing track and say, all right, look, I found this backing track in this uh, piece of music, uh, it came along with it, you can upload that backing track and have your students sing or play over it. That does require a little bit of work for you, but that's called a template task where you're creating half the task for the students and then they're completing it. And then last but not least, uh, there's free play. And free play is when students can just go in and use the software without being assigned anything. So it's really useful. There's a lot of other software, a lot of restrictions out there where a student can only do what a teacher has assigned. We, we don't do that. The students can play or sing or, or use the software anytime they want uh, with no restrictions. So that's called free play. It's all single sign-on. By the way, it does integrate with Google Classroom. So if you're already using Google Classroom, we have a single sign-on from Google Classroom. Uh, it is browser-based completely, and it works if a student is using an iPhone, starts a project, and then later on picks up a Chromebook, and then later on after that picks up a Dell laptop. It doesn't matter. Whatever device they're on, we don't care as long as they're uh, accessing it through the Chrome browser. So let's take a look. I've done enough yapping now. We're going to go over, and I'm going to show you what the teacher view of Music First looks like. So when you log in as a teacher, you'll see the classes that you're currently teaching. And for, for today's demonstration, I, I created a class called the Appleton Middle School Band. All right, and we're gonna be doing some assignments there a little bit later. But the first software program that I'd like to show you, and all of our software lives up here in the software tab. And again, no two teachers have the same lineup. We have everything turned on. You would probably have two or three things turned on, not all of them. But I'm gonna click on Sight Reading Factory, and that will log me in and launch Sight Reading Factory. So it remembers, hey, welcome back, Jim Frankel. I'm gonna click Start Sight Reading. So here's a couple of ideas for how you might be able to use Sight Reading Factory software with your students. If you're teaching in, an, in, a, in person or in a hybrid environment, it's really great that there are um, ensemble sight reading examples. So let's say you're a choir director, and I say, you know, I would like to um, have my students right at the beginning of every one of our um, virtual or in-person or hybrid uh, rehearsals, I'd like them to sing through something. And by the way, if you're doing it over Zoom or Google Meet, just have the students mute their microphones. Anyway, I'm gonna do a choir multi-part. I'm gonna do, I can do different levels. In this case, I'm gonna do level three, which is pretty simple. I'm going to make this for SATB choir. So I'm gonna do soprano, alto. I'll do tenors, reading, treble, clef, and bass. All right, I'm gonna click next. It asks me what time signature. So I'll pick something very easy, 4-4. Four, four. What key signature? Uh, I'll do it in C major, why not? I can either do free play, which is great if you're doing it with a group, 
or a challenge, which is more of an individualized kind of experience. So for now, I'm gonna click Start Free Play. I'm gonna open it up. And I would like my students to be able to see um, some text. So what you can do is if you click on this little gearbox, you can click Use Annotations. I'm going to do Movable Dough with a La Base Minor. So I'm gonna close this out. I'm gonna click Next and it will add text to it, right? So I can zoom this in a little bit so you can see a little better. Um, there we go. So what I can do is now here an opening pitch. Let's do that one more time. And you can change whether or not uh, you want the block chord, whether you uh, want it arpeggiated, how you want it arpeggiated. There's everything under the sun. So what I can do is uh, do, I, and you give all the students their opening pitches, and then they would play or sing through it. So do, re, do, re, mi, fa, so, fa, mi, re, do, ti, do, do. You get the idea. Now, this is not recording me. It's not doing anything. I'm just using it as uh, producing sight reading fodder, if you will. So back to how I started the, uh, the, the session. You know, when I was a middle school band director, if I could go in and instead of a choir, if I can go in and say, you know what, I want to do this for a concert band, and I would like to put this in B flat major, um, and I'm going to click free play. This would be awesome. Uh, by the way, let me get rid of those uh, annotations. I'll click next. This would be fantastic for me as a band director because now I don't have an excuse. There's, it's right there ready to go. Let me zoom out so you can see the percussion part. So um, it's pretty, it looks like it's unison. That's pretty easy. Uh, I can play through it. Is it the world's greatest composition? Absolutely not. Here we go. Now there are multi-part, it's not all in unison, but this is great. If I click next, it gives me another one. If I click next, it gives me another one. If I wanna go in, I can change the level. I can say, you know what, let's make this uh, a level four uh, and let's click start free play. So I've got a little something different now. Uh, you can print these out. It's great for an ensemble um, kind of experience. What I'd like to do now though is quickly shift and show you uh, an individualized one. So I'm going to, even though I'm not really a singer at all, I'm going to choose voice family, I'm going to choose bass, I'm gonna choose level two because I'm gonna sight read in front of you and I'm <laughs> quite nervous about doing that. I'm doing it in C major. I'm gonna click start uh, free play. I'm actually going to, um, you know what I'm gonna do? Not, not in free play, let me do this instead. I'm gonna do challenge mode. Um, and I am going to put in uh, the annotations just so I have something to sing. Uh, and I'm go it's going to give me 10 seconds before I have to start recording. So here we go. I'm going to click start. I get to see what I'm doing. That's fine. All right, here we go. I get, I'm going to get a count in. Do, ti, do, re. Re, do, mi, fa, mi, do, ti, do, mi, re, do, mi, so, so, la, so, mi, do. All right, so that made a recording. I can uh, click retry, I can hand it in. Um, let me hear what it sounds like, that's fine. All right, you get the idea. You don't need to hear any more of me. Now, what you can do as a teacher with Sight Reading Factory is give your students weekly, daily, monthly, whatever you want, sight reading examples to perform. It does not auto assess them. It just makes auto recordings, audio recordings. And believe it or not, every student will receive a different example. So no two kids are getting the same one. It's pure sight reading every time. Really, really great way to engage the students and get them sight reading. So we're going to say goodbye to Sight Reading Factory for now. I'm going to come back to it in a little bit. Now what we're going to do is open up our most popular software title, which is called Practice First. And again, um, I am a, uh, an assessment geek. Uh, that's what my doctoral dissertation was on. So I helped uh, design a lot of the way that Practice First works. 
uh, it's really, uh, we think, pretty good. And we came up with something really unique. It does not color the note heads, but instead gives feedback a very different way. So I'm going to choose voice because I do not have my tuba with me. And I am going to choose, oh, I'm going to choose, I'm in New York right now. I'm going to pick the NISMA sight reading examples because they're nice and short, so you don't have to hear a lot. So I'm going to do sight reading level one, exercise number two. I'm going to choose my part. Once I select my part, then I get the record option. Uh, I'm going to click record and I'll get my opening pitch. Let me just zoom in a little bit so you can see it better. I'm going to click record. I can hear, uh, I have a tuner. I, have the, I can listen to the backing track in my headphones if I want. But I'm just going to make a very simple recording to show you what our assessment algorithm and feedback looks like. Now, importantly, I'm going to make a few mistakes on purpose just to show you the way that the feedback works. So here we go. Do, re, mi, fa, so, fa, mi, re, mi, re, do, re, mi, fa, so, so, fa, mi, re, mi, re, do. All right, so you may have noticed that I got some notes out of tune. I sang some notes too short. I sped up. I did a whole bunch of really great things. So here's how our feedback works. And I'm going to tell you right now, I am so proud of this because it gives so much feedback, way more than other programs. And I hope you agree. So I got an aggregate score on that of a 77%. The score is yellow because that means that my teacher is telling me that it is not good enough to turn in. As soon as it turns green, that means that it's good enough. But for right now, that yellow means you did, a, you did, you got quite a few things wrong, Jim. You might want to try again. So that score is then broken down into three categories. The first is how much of the piece you played. So as long as you play all of it, that is your score. So I got a 77 because I played or sang 100% of it. My pitch score was a 67. And that, that's a little painful, but, you know, uh, I'm a tuba player, so you can forgive me. My rhythmic score was an 87, so I did pretty well, but there were certain things that I didn't do so well, and I think you probably heard them. So let me close this out and, and show you. Now, I am, uh, I am really proud of this assessment algorithm. We call it, I call it personally, the psychedelic slug trail. So when you mouse over, yellow, by the way, I won't mouse over yet. Yellow means it wasn't right, but it wasn't wrong. It was somewhere in between. Green means totally right. Red means totally wrong. So when I mouse over this, it tells me that my note, do, was a little flat. I then started this one great, then got sharp. And then here I was, all, I was really sharp. Then I was fine there. This one I had a little bit of a dip, but it wasn't bad enough. So these are all going great. And then I got a little sharp at the end. And wow, I then sang a D flat instead of a D natural. Uh, and then I cut this one off early. I breathed a little bit too early. I sang a D flat again, very flat here, a little flat. Then I cut all these notes off early. So it doesn't mark them wrong, but it does take off points because I did not sing them for an entire quarter note. So very flat and you cut it off early. Wow, you sang a D flat here. Uh, that was a little sharp. And then you see this huge um, uptick. That means that my tempo increased. Now with other programs, if I sang quickly like that, all three notes would be wrong. But instead, they're right, but it notices that I just sang it faster. So that's really, really good feedback. I hope you agree. So practice first, uh, we're really proud of it. Let me just go back here. A lot of questions we always get, and a lot of people knock us. They say, oh, well, you don't have anywhere near enough um, content or not as much as others. Uh, that's, in my opinion, it's overstated. We have 39,000 pieces of content and we're constantly adding to it. There are some publishers who are also competitors who do not want to license us their content. So even though we keep asking and begging, they won't give it to us. Maybe you could try. Um, but for the large, uh, but for, for the publishers that do work with us, they give us a lot of stuff. So we have lots of method books. We've got lots of scales, lots of... Um, uh, we even have repertoire at this point. We don't have anywhere near the repertoire that, that something like smart music has, but we're, we're getting there. The most important thing, and this is what a lot of people love about Practice First, is that it's very easy to make your own exercises, and the vast majority of our users are doing just that. They're creating their own things. So you can make an audio-only exercise. 
And what that allows you to do is record yourself or record a student performing what you want the other students to be assessed on. So especially with things like vibrato, with uh, rubato, with, you know, tempo chain, all the things that, you know, make music kind of unique, um, you can just make a simple recording and the students will be assessed only on that recording. They won't see any sheet music on their screen. They'll just see an audio file. And that's really pretty cool because they already have the sheet music probably. Um, so they just play the sheet music and the assessment algorithm tells them how well they did based on that recording. Then of course, you can also upload a, um, let me go back here. You can also upload a score. So you can upload anything that you get from MuseScore that you create in MuseScore or you find on MuseScore.com, but you can also upload any music XML file. <clears throat> and that's really, really useful. If you're using a program like Finale or Sibelius, the music XML files are weird when they export. So most of the instruments will sound like piano. So you'll have to maybe edit that in a program like MuseScore, make sure that the instrument parts come through. Or if you don't care about the piano sound, then it works just fine. But you can upload your own stuff, which is really great. There's also a shared folder where band directors, choir directors, orchestra directors are making their own pieces and sharing them. There's also a premium folder where you can go in and buy um, content from other publishers. And there's a lot, uh, we just added the standard of excellence jazz method. There's a whole bunch of method books and repertoire that we're adding to this. It's really, it's getting there. Uh, we're really pleased with the amount of content that's available. So practice first. Um, now let me la at last show you um, Note Flight. And then I'm gonna show you how all these programs uh, can work together. So you may have, uh, may have been using Note Flight uh, for years and just this summer, uh, they launched a, a kind of a new feature, if you will, called Soundcheck. So I'm going to open up a random uh, piece of music, and it's called Sight Reading Number 10 in B flat major. And if you pay the additional $3 per user to get Soundcheck, this is what it looks like. So here's my uh, piece. I can play it. All right, now if I want to make this or anything that I create or anything that I import into NoteFlight an accessible file, you click on the score details button. Again, this is only if you've already purchased Soundcheck. It doesn't come automatically. It's not, it's not included. There's my little Soundcheck uh, button. If I click on that, it says create Soundcheck score. So I'm going to do that right now. I can choose uh, the scoring threshold, the level of difficulty. I'm going to make this easy. Uh, the number of attempts allowed. I'm just going to click create and it will now convert this piece of note flight, uh, you know, notation file to an accessible sound check file. So it's just doing that uh, calculation right now. You can see this little uh, thermometer. Now, note flight is uh, $49 and then $2 per user, and that's per year. You add sound check for $3 additional to that. And then um, NoteFlight has also made all of the Hal Leonard content libraries, which is hundreds of pieces of content for band, choir, and orchestra, available for an additional $3 a user. So for the $49 base fee plus $8 a user, you can get a uh, sound check with a whole bunch of Hal Leonard content in it. So now you'll see that I'm in NoteFlight, but I'm actually in a sound check file. I can play it. All right, so let's go back to the beginning. And now I'm going to assess myself. Here we go. Click record. All right, that's great. That's as much as I can do. You see here that I only played 26% of it. And what I did do, I got a 70 out of, a, out of 80, of, which is a scoring threshold. My pitch was okay. My rhythm was okay. But let me go here and show you what I did. Oh, this is really interesting. All right, so I went all over the place. So uh, again, just like practice first, you mouse over it. It tells you what you did right. And these little dips are my tempo variation. So obviously, I was all over the place here. So um, again, Note Flight is a great notation program, and they just added this feature. They have a giant library of content uh, that you can purchase. They also have a free uh, content library that, uh, called the Note Flight Content Library uh, that's got a couple of hundred pieces. So pretty, pretty good uh, option. Very different than Practice First. The differences 
are in the repertoire. So Practice First has repertoire from many other publishers. And for at least right now, Note Flight only has um, content from um, Hal Leonard. Uh, they will be adding shortly uh, essential elements. If the students already have the essential elements book, they'll be able to put a code in to unlock uh, that. And then Hal Leonard obviously has a tremendous amount of content already that students, uh, that you can buy as part of the Hal Leonard content libraries. So that's the three of them. Now, how does all of this work with the Music First Classroom? So I'm gonna open up the Appleton Middle School Band class. And I am going to make a sight reading factory assignment and a practice first assignment, and then show you what it looks like as a student. So I'm in my class, I click create task. And now what I'm gonna do is make a sight reading task. I'm gonna call it sight reading, excuse me, I have my caps lock on, sight reading task, right? Then it says, what type of task is this? Well, it's going to be, there are nine different types. There's audio recording, video submissions, to do, read, watch, listen, write, evaluations. We even have a brand new feature for auditions called evaluation. But for right now, we're going to do music for a software, and we're going to choose Sight Reading Factory. And I'm going to say, very clear instructions, Sight Read This. Okay, obviously you would probably, now you can include anything in here, pictures, web links, PDFs, or whatever you want. But for right now, just putting that, when is this due? Let's make this due on Friday, December 4th. Is it visible to the students? Yes. Is it assigned to everybody? Yes. You can make groups of students and assign it only to specific groups. You can also, uh, like, let's say your, your sopranos, your altos, your cellos, your basses, your flutes, your, you know, your saxophones. You can then tag it to standards. Um, and we have every state standard as well as national standards. And you can add it to the grade book. I'm gonna make this worth 100 points, okay? I can create a grading rubric if I want, but for the interest of time, I'm not going to. I'm just gonna click Create Task. Once I've done that, I now need to co connect this task to Sight Reading Factory. If you remember the four different task types, uh, you can make a generic task, a specific, a template, or free play. I'm gonna make this a specific one. Um, so I'm gonna click Open in Sight, in fact, uh, uh, I'm gonna actually make it a generic test just to show you how easy this is. I'm gonna say, choose your instrument and then sight read, okay? Now, how many attempts? Unlimited configuration. Let the students choose their instruments, but now I'm gonna choose everything else. I'm gonna say level one. Um, I'm gonna choose the key signature for them. I'm just gonna say uh, C major, B flat major, the only two that are available. This is great if you're getting kids ready for auditions. I'm only gonna make three, four, and four, four available. I'm gonna make it eight measures long. The tempo is gonna be 100. I'm gonna give the students 10 seconds before they have to start recording. I'm gonna add a metronome, uh, actually without a subdivision, so that they can have a metronome playing while they are recording. Uh, I'm gonna make the measures disappear. So once the measure's finished, the measure will disappear. Um, I'm going to choose note annotations, fix a uh, movable dough with a law base minor, and I'm gonna click attach assignment to task. Are you sure? Yes, I am. All right, so I've made a sight reading task. Now I'm gonna make a practice first task. Oh, but see here, just sorry, lost my train of thought. If you wanted to, you can click share in Google Classroom and share it with whatever Google Classroom you want, right? That's a really nice little feature. You can also share it on Remind. Those of you using things like Canvas and Schoology, Every task has a unique URL that you can copy, paste it into Canvas or Schoology and say, go to this task. And it will, once the students have logged in once, it will remember their login information and take them directly to that task so that they can complete it. So that's what all of our Canvas and Schoology users do. So anyway, I'm gonna move on and make a practice first task. I'm gonna call this practice first. And I'm gonna choose practice first from the drop down menu. And just like I did, I'm gonna say, uh, play your best. I know that I will be singing, but we'll pretend that the student will be playing. When is this due? Let's make this also due on uh, this coming Friday. Uh, I'm going to make this worth 100 points. And just like I did with Sight Reading Factory task, I'm going to go here and immediately open up practice first. Okay, I have to connect music first to practice first. So I do that. And the, I'm gonna show you how you would do a generic task, but I'm gonna make this one a specific because we just did a generic one. 
if I wanted to make a generic, I click create generic assignment, one button, it's done. And then the students go in and they choose their piece. But for this case, I'm not, I'm gonna do something very specific. So I'm gonna go into, uh, I'm gonna choose voice. I'm gonna find that piece that I want them to do. And I'm actually gonna choose NISMA again. And I'm gonna pick the exact piece. I'll do something different. Let's do exercise three. And once I found the piece that I want them to play and, and everything in practice versus in score form. So the students choose from the score drop down menu. I'm gonna click assign to student. Now here's something really cool. You can do advanced options. and I strongly recommend doing this. <clears throat> and the uh, score goal is 80. That if you remember earlier, my 77 was yellow. Um, that's because I made the threshold 80. So they have to get 80 or better to submit it. I'm gonna make the uh, grading algorithm easy. I can turn the tempo goal on, which means, and by the way, this 100 is not beats per minute, but instead is 100% of the original tempo. Um, so that, if I turn that off, the students can change the tempo and not have their grade affected. If I turn it on, they have to play it at the tempo given. I'm playing mode, I can do free mode, and we strongly recommend with the metronome so the students hear the metronome. Um, if you do free mode, the cursor follows them and that confuses a lot of people. And if you have a backing track, you can do that. Uh, and um, you could do sight reading or memorization. Sight reading disables the play button. Memorization, the music disappears the minute you click record. So I'm gonna click a regular and I'm not gonna do an attempts limit. I'm gonna give them unlimited attempts. I'm gonna click add and it's done. So now what I'm gonna do is shift at, to what a student sees. So here's what a student will see when they click on the Appleton Middle School Band. Let me log in as demo student. So I log in and I've got my two tasks here. So I'm gonna do the sight reading task first and click on it. I'm gonna click open in sight reading factory. By the way, the reason I'm not showing you the no flight with sound check, it works exactly the same as practice first. So it would kind of be redundant. Anyway, uh, it gives you, hey, is this is the first time you're ever doing this, you might wanna watch this video. Nah, I've, I've done this before. Now for um, first time students, when and, and really every time they're doing an assignment, they need to test their microphone. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that, allow. So it gives me a little countdown. And here we go, me, 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 me. All right, so let's see how that does. I'm gonna listen. Sure, you enjoyed that as much as I did. And I'm gonna click sounds good. And what that does now, it says choose your instrument and then sight read. So I'm gonna to go to voice family. I'm gonna click bass. And it's gonna give me 10 seconds. I have eight measures at a BPM of 100 and metronome. Okay, here we go. Wish me luck. I'm gonna click start assignment. I'm gonna hear that opening pitch. All right, here we go. Do, re, re, mi, mi, fa, so, fa, mi, re, re, do, re, mi, fa, mi, re, do. All right, I can listen to it. Uh, this is really important. If I decide to try another one, it will give me a brand new assignment so that it's pure sight reading every time. A lot of kids, when they see that, they get very upset, so you might wanna tell them. But I'm not gonna do any better than that, so I'm gonna click Submit Assignment. Are you sure? Yes, I am, and now I've submitted it. Now what I'm gonna do is do the Practice First Assignment, and then I'm gonna show you what a teacher sees. So you'll see sight reading task has already been submitted. I'm gonna do Practice First Task now. Now if you remember, I gave the students a specific example, so it will load that specific example, I have to choose my part, which is bass, and then I'm going to record it. Here we go. Do, ti, do, re, mi, fa, mi, re, mi, mi, re, re, do, Re, do, ti, ti, do, do. All right, hey, first time ever I got 100. By the way, the reason that I got 100 on that, uh, other than that I really didn't make a mistake, is that I put the assessment algorithm at easy. 
uh, it is almost impossible uh, to get 100 if it's on medium. So, uh, wow, that's a first. I wish I had a camera to take a picture of this. I'm very excited. So I'm gonna click Submit to Teacher. I've never been so proud. That's terrific. All right, so I'm done. Let's see what a teacher sees. If I go into the Appleton Middle School Band, I can see that I have one task to grade, but not two. Well, that's really weird. Why not? Well, the practice first task is automatically added to the gradebook. So if I go to my gradebook, you'll see here that the practice first already sent a grade of 100, so I don't need to grade it. That's really great, especially if you have 100 students or more, it's really nice. But Sight Reading Factory, you have to grade it, and that's because they do not do automated assessment. There's a long story about that, but I won't go into it here. It's just not gonna happen. So you'll see here that demo student has submitted something. This little paper clip with submission is a direct link to the student's piece of music that they sight read as well as their recording. So if I click play, All right, I'm not gonna hear all that or subject you to it. I'm gonna give them a 98 rather than 100 just because. I'm gonna click save. And now the grading is completed. I click okay. I can get out of here. If I refresh this page, you'll see that the grade of 100 has come through from Sight Reading Factory, or 98, excuse me, has come through from Sight Reading Factory. If I go to my gradebook, I now have a 98 and a 100. You'll see here that the grades are hidden. That's because you want to collect the grades from every student before you publish them. Uh, really simple to do. If I go in here, I can um, click on um, the actual task and click show grade. So now my students will see that. Um, and there we go. Now, let's say, for example, if I go in here and this student recorded the wrong thing or recording the wrong part, let me just go in and, and view this task. Um, not all of our software, but some of it has a clear submission that clear submission gives that task right back to the student so they have to do it again, if you will, right? So I'm gonna show you one last thing um, that uh, might be of interest, um, and that is our audio recorder. Um, if I click on Create Task, and in this time, I'm just going to say Record Yourself, you know, you don't always have to use the software. If you just want to make a quick recording and have the students self-populate their own digital portfolio throughout the year with you, this is really simple. I'm just going to click record audio and I'm going to say sing your favorite song. All right, that's all. Uh, this is going to be due uh, again on Friday. These poor kids have so much homework. I'm gonna make this worth, I don't know, let's make it only worth 10 points uh, and create task. Really, really simple, I just made that. Now, if I wanted to, I can make this task a favorite and then I can use it in multiple classes or I can use it over and over within this class. If I go to my class calendar, right, and I click up my from favorites, right at the very bottom is the record yourself task that I just made. I can actually click and use this over and over by clicking and dragging so that every day they have to make a new recording, right? But I'm not gonna do that, that's kind of, that's kind of mean. Uh, but just know that uh, you can uh, make any task a favorite and then use it over and over, right? So I'm gonna get rid of this one as well because I don't want the students to be confused. And now I'll show you what it looks like as a student when I come back into my Appleton Middle School Band there's a, oh, I did my submissions, I got my grades. If I click on the grade tab, I can see that, oh, I did really, really well. I'm doing great in music. Now it's record yourself. So I click on that. I just wanna show you how easy this is. Uh, this is a really simple audio recorder, right? So uh, if I click, yeah, I'd like the metronome to click, or I wanna count in, uh, and I'm gonna make this 120 beats per minute. And I'm gonna click start recording. In Dublin's fair city, where girls are so pretty, I first set my eyes on sweet Molly Malone. All right, so I've made my beautiful recording. In Dublin's fair city, where girls... I can discard it and record it again, or I could click submit. So I'm clicking submit because you don't want to hear me sing any more than I already have. I'm going to go back in here to show you what that looks like as a teacher because... 
The audio recorder does not do automated assessment. Only practice first and note flight with sound check do that. If I click on the record yourself, again, I don't have to download this recording. It's right here. If I click on it, it's embedded right there in the gradebook. I can hear the recording. That's wonderful. I'm going to give that student a 9 out of 10. And I can make a comment to them, right? Now, a couple of questions I'm sure that you have. Uh, if you want to, if you if you're have to use something like PowerSchool or eSchool Backpack or whatever gradebook um, you have, we have the ability to export our gradebook and you can import it into any other gradebook, which is super helpful. Um, and uh, a lot of people, what a lot of people do in reality, though, is they use a split screen where they'll have our gradebook and their other gradebook and they'll just enter the grades in quickly. But there is a gradebook uh, export uh, feature, which is really helpful. All right, so before I go back uh, to the presentation and, and wrap up, I just wanted to show you um, the content library, which I alluded to at the beginning of the session. It's really, really uh, pretty awesome, I think. Um, so I'm going to go in. Let's say I'm a choir director. I click on the chorus bucket of uh, content. And when I go in here, there are tons and tons of pre-made uh, lessons and courses. But here is something pretty cool. There's a pre-made high school chorus course. So if I click on that, we had an amazing choir director create this course for us. And she put in all of her lesson plans. Uh, and we think it's great. So these are already made. There's a whole bunch of critiques made, ear training exercises, improvisation, um, performance assessments that you can reuse, compositions, sight singing. There's a lot of stuff in here. If you say, oh, this is really, really great. You can just click use this course now, rename it, and away you go. You've got a course to, and of course, any content that's in there can be edited, changed, adapted, however you want to, uh, so that it fits your program. Uh, if you're a general music teacher or have to teach general music, maybe your um, your ensembles, uh, your administrators made you do that. We've got five general music courses already ready to go, right? So, hey, there's a middle school music technology class, uh, project-based learning, really great stuff made by amazing an amazing music educator from Rochester, New York. All these lesson plans are already created for you, so you don't have to do anything um, if you don't want to. We have a resources tab, which allows you to embed things like Flipgrid. We have Intune Monthly for all your students and you. And we even have musictheory.net, which you can um, give your students musictheory.net assignments. And when they go to musictheory.net, they can submit them to you. It's still a link that you have to click, but it makes it a whole lot easier than them emailing it to you. Anyway, what I'm gonna do now is shift back to uh, our my presentation and just show you a couple of things um, before we wrap up. First of all, thank you for um, staying with me for this long in the session, appreciate it. We do have a vibrant community on Facebook. So there's a Music First Teachers group. It's meant to be only for Music First customers, but we do have a lot of people who are trialing the software and wanna ask questions. Just look for Music First Teachers. We have a Twitter and LinkedIn uh, page that's, that's pretty active. Um, but I am most proud of our Music First podcast. If you go to SoundCloud or Spotify or Apple iTunes or Stitcher, however you get to your podcast, just look for Music First podcast. What we do is every other week, we highlight a music teacher from, uh, from our customer base, and they describe what they're doing with their students. And especially now during the age of COVID, all the interviews are, how are you managing this? How are you doing it hybrid, virtual, in person, whatever they're doing. And it's really, uh, they're really some wonderful conversations with fabulous music educators. It's free professional development. Strongly recommend you check those out. We also have a, a really great uh, video channel on YouTube. All of our tutorial videos and, and our you know, user manual, lifetime free tech support, our support team at Music First, and I mean this with, in full sincerity, is the best. Uh, there is no other company out there that has a better customer support team. So uh, I, my hats off uh, to all Juliana and Tori and Brad, a fabulous, fabulous support team, and they will help you figure this out. If you would like to get a free 30-day trial to Music First, you can go to musicfirst.com, and in the upper right-hand corner, you can click on Request Trial, 
fill out your name. You get it for 30 days. You can start it whenever you want to uh, and, and try out. All the software will be turned on. All the content is there. You can do everything. It's not a watered down version. It's, it's, it's really, um, it, it'll give you a, a flavor of, of, of what you can do. Now, last but not least, we have professional development courses. We have certification courses. Those are all free. Uh, if you would like graduate credits, there's a fee to get those graduate credits, but you can get three graduate credits for something like $150 to take our courses. So I urge you to do that. Anyway, it's been a real pleasure um, discussing this with you, albeit virtually. Uh, my email, in case you're interested, is jim at musicfirst.com. If you have a generic question, general question, you go to info at musicfirst.com. But I, I wish you all the best for the remainder of this school year. It's been difficult to say the least, but you're kind of, you're rocking it. And you're here on an online professional development trying to figure it out. So from all of us at Music First, thank you so much for doing what you do. Keep the faith. And uh, we're all looking forward to being back in person with our students making music very, very soon. But until that time, I truly hope that you'll consider uh, Music First as part of your solution for teaching. Anyway. Thank you all very much. Hope you enjoyed it. Talk soon. Bye.